I want to talk about a piece that was published in The Guardian today, a long piece by Kevin Rudd. He was in charge of Australia from uh, 2007 to 10. And again, in 2013, he's Australian Labour Party. And Kevin Rudd is a Mandarin speaker who had a diplomatic career before he became prime minister. And he's a bit of a China hand. He's got a, a pretty good knowledge of China. He's quite well, well respected, I guess, within sort of China watching circles. And he's got a book coming out called The Avoidable War, The Dangers of a Catastrophic Conflict Between the US and Xi Jinping's China. And so The Guardian have published a, a long excerpt from the book today, and I, I just finished reading it. And in this excerpt, he mentions the Thucydides trap, uh, which I'm sure many listeners will have heard about. Uh, the Peloponnesian case, the history of the Peloponnesian Wars? Yeah, exactly. Um, and we should have Arjun on actually to talk about this from from. Oh, he in fought in the Peloponnesian Wars, Arjun, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wouldn't surprise. Yes. Um, <laughs> wouldn't put it past him. Uh, so anyway, the Thucydides trap is a is a term that's been thrown around quite a bit in the past. Uh, I would say five years, and it's it's based on this idea. Um, so Thucydides was he was an ancient Greek historian, writing in around the fifth century BC. Uh, in Athens, and he wrote a history of the Peloponnesian War, which was fought between Sparta and Athens, and which Sparta eventually won. And in his history, Thucydides concluded that it was the rise of Athens and the fear that this instilled in Sparta that made war inevitable. So it's the idea that a rising power uh, has a great kind of disruptive potential to an established power, you know, let's say a large, well-established empire. And a few years ago, I'm not sure exactly when, but a professor at Harvard in the political science department called Graham Allison, he developed the notion of the Thucydides trap. And I'm going to quote from him. Uh, he says, this is that there is an, a natural, inevitable discombobulation that occurs when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power. And he was particularly um, writing about this in relation to the rise of China and its effect on the established kind of hegemonic power of the United States. And so the critical thing here is to note that he's suggesting war is actually inevitable when these dynamics are present. And in his piece in The Guardian today, his excerpt from his book, Kevin Rudd kind of picks up on this and suggests ways in which this war, potential war between the US and China is not actually inevitable. And he lays out a few ways of basically um, ensuring that it doesn't happen. Uh, and it's very interesting. I recommend it to everybody. It, it obviously is a is a very scary thought, but his argument is basically that we need to be we need to really be thinking about it in order to stop it. Right, right. Just, I, I want to talk about this in a second. Thucydides, they say uh, history is written by the victor, right? Mm. But he was Athenian. The, right. the Spartans, have, they didn't have their own historians to to I thought history is written by the people who win that's well, bizarre Ath Athenian culture was pretty advanced uh at the time and I'm not I'm not a classicist so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be drawn into this by you David but All right but so <laughs> we have to avoid a war with China the hot mm. spot would be Taiwan that yeah. what I've been reading is that West exec the lobbyists from West Exec who control what's left of Joe Biden's brain, that if China attacks Taiwan, we have to we have to go in. And that this has been going on since Obama did the Pacific pivot. 
which is kind of like the butter churn, but it's easier to, if you're getting older, it's an easier dance. Is that true? Is Taiwan the flashpoint? Uh, I think Taiwan is the most likely flashpoint, yes. But that being said, and I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago on the show, I don't think it's as as hot as people think it is right now. I think that especially given what's happening in Ukraine, um, I think China would be extremely reluctant and discouraged to launch an actual invasion of Taiwan at this point. In fact, last week, uh, there was a kind of announcement from one of the Taiwanese intelligence agencies where they came out and said they've got intelligence, or, or maybe they're just bluffing, but they said they had intelligence to the effect that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has set China's timeline back at least four years for an invasion of Taiwan. Now, I was kind of surprised that there was a timeline in place. I'm not sure there is, but I think the point is well taken that um, the current kind of global situation makes an invasion of Taiwan much, much less likely for China. And you have to remember that right now the Chinese economy is in a bit of a rough spot. There are currently lockdowns in Shanghai that people probably will have heard about. Um, there are some stories that, that some people in Shanghai are not getting enough food. Uh, they're not able to leave their apartments because the lockdown is so strict due to the spread of the Omicron variant. Um, and this is, this is causing some concern, I think, for the Chinese economy. Um, this is a big year for China. It's heading into the 20th National Party Congress in November, which is a huge kind of leadership transition for Xi Jinping, where he's expected to obviously get another term. People are now saying that Xi Jinping looks like he'll be in power till at least 2032. And that he could oversee, you know, the transformation of China into the world's kind of number one economic power by that point. So right. there's a lot going on. And I think this piece by Kevin Rudd, and I want to point uh, listeners to another piece in The Guardian from earlier this week by a guest uh, that I brought on the show last year, Tobita Chow. Uh, he was a great guest. He was on episode 1245. That was last June. He wrote a piece with um, Jake Werner. They both work on kind of progressive, making the case for a progressive US-China alliance. Tough case to make right now. But they've got a piece this week also basically saying that the US and China really must work together um, and that we should not assume that Russia and China are as aligned as certain parts of the media are making them out to be. Um, I think for those two, for those two writers, for Jake Werner and Tabita Chow, I think their position is that the US has basically pushed China away and China has no choice but to align with Russia, given that the US keeps rebuffing, re, um, keeps kind of rejecting its overtures. Right. I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I think China kind of gives as good as it gets, but I think their their point is is a really important one um, and that we should distinguish between China and Russia. I think Russia, on the one hand, is a is a, a rather disruptive revisionist power. I think China can also be seen as a revisionist power, but one that is much more constructive in its revisionism. I think China wants a place at the table. It wants to help to construct whatever this next world order is going to be. I'm not mm -hmm. sure it has the aspirations to hegemony that that certain corners of, of the right, I think, um, ascribe to it. So, Right. Taiwan's economy, how is it doing compared to China's? And what does China want from Taiwan? Is it is it what they want from Hong Kong? Why, why would China want to invade Taiwan? And what does a progressive foreign policy mean? Those are three separate questions. You can decide which one you want to answer. 
um, okay, why does Taiwan, why does China want Taiwan? That, that has to do with history, and that's kind of the territory that I'm most comfortable on. So thank you for that. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> China, China has long claimed that um, Taiwan is a kind of inalienable part of its national sovereign territory. Now, this claim, I think, is rather spurious, and, and I have disputed it on this show. I don't think we need to go too far into that. Um, but basically, there are longstanding, deep historical claims when it comes to Taiwan that go to the, the very core of China's national self-identity and the Communist Party's legitimacy. Um, there is some speculation, and I've read some academic, uh, some kind of scholarly work that suggests that that if if China were to invade Taiwan and it and it had trouble taking back Taiwan, quote unquote, taking it back, that could cause a, an enormous crisis of legitimacy for the Communist Party. It could end them, is is the idea. So it's a very big deal. Um, it's because it's there are relatives. You have your your it's brother against sister, sister against brother. Is that it's why some, we're I would say it's not quite on that level in the same way that we see with Russia and Ukraine. There's a lot of this rhetoric of brotherhood and fraternity around the relationships between Russia and Ukraine, which I think is right. Taiwan is a bit of a different beast. Um, Taiwan has since it was occupied by Japan in 1895. And even before that, Taiwan has been developing along a separate trajectory. And it's sort of developed its own national identity, its own kind of Taiwanese nationalism, which is a much more inclusive nationalism than the one that you see in, say, Russia or China. It's a nationalism based on shared values, based on kind of civic engagement, based on voting. Taiwan has a very vibrant democracy. Um, and so, so why would America care about it then? Well, America <laughs> could learn quite a lot from Taiwan. I, I know. I, I'm saying this. Why, why would we be protecting that kind of government? Well, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's a lot of paradoxes in the US-Taiwan relationship as well, given that some of the some of Taiwan's greatest champions in the US government are some of the worst figures, you know, the, the Marco oh, Rubios yeah. of this world. Well, I would love, uh, hopefully you're going to keep coming back. I would love to learn about Chiang Kai-shek, how he left mainland China. And I don't know why he ended up on Taiwan. Uh, I would assume he lost a civil war to Mao and yeah. Cho and Lai, and there were people who went with him, and these would be, I would assume, fervent anti-communists. Yeah. And so they decided to build a culture that was the opposite of what they called back then Red China. Mm. But you said it was occupied by Japan before mm. that, so there are capitalist roots on that island. That's fascinating. It's a it's a real melting pot, Taiwan. It um, yeah. there are lots of influences, and what it's what it's developed into is is something that I think no one, the Japanese nor nor the nationalist Chinese, could have envisaged. It's um there are Aboriginal influences on Taiwanese culture that are also really really interesting and have have deep historical roots. So we can definitely talk about that yeah. and the the kind Taiwan. of I'm sorry. Sorry. No, go ahead. Well, Taiwan is kind of colonizing China economic, like economically. Foxconn is a Taiwanese company. Yeah. Making yeah. all our, and they're enslaving the Chinese worker in part. I think uh, with, uh, I, I can't pronounce where the Uyghurs are. Uh, oh, Xinjiang. That they that they're that they're part of the Foxconn enslaves Chinese people at their factories. So that's. Well, there are some, the Taiwan and China economically are intimately entangled. And I think for China, 
China would say that actually Foxconn is is doing China a real solid, like it's it's contributing right. to their economy, it's creating jobs. Um, it's a really, it's quite well respected and well thought of in China. But yeah, there is this long tradition of economic collaboration between, you know, big Taiwanese corporations who go to the mainland, set up factories, um, and have have very kind of deep ties. So right. the two economies are very closely connected and dependent on, upon each other. When you come back, hopefully next week, we could talk about what a progressive foreign policy would look like. Please, I'm going to get complaints that I cut you off too soon. Explain to everybody that we agreed that this was going to be a 10 to 15 minute segment, because I'm going to get so many complaints about talking too much, making bad jokes, interrupting you, but most importantly, cutting you short. Didn't, but it was a 10 minute segment, right? Yeah, we said 10 to 15 minutes. It right. was all agreed with your with your fabulous producer. Right. So I, I'm not cutting you because I'm going to get complaints. So no, I, no, it's it's OK. I mean, yeah, I'll uh, we, I'll give I'll send up the bat signal if I need. <laughs> Grace Jackson, rescue. We, we love you here and we're glad you're back.